Okay, so we'll get started today and our agenda looks like we'll have a report out from provider education and policy reform. Dr. Burstein will be providing that for us with their latest updated statistics. The treatment provider group will give us an update. Jen Thibe will be doing that. Thank you very much for that. We're really interested in what's happening. Hospitals and emergency departments, the matters project, um, Dr. Lynch, Kaylee Logren, they'll be reporting out. The next will be the harm reduction group under my auspices, and we'll tell you about what's happened for some programs and some outcomes that we've had and new things that are occurring coming out of the task force. After that, we will talk to the families and consumers. Deb Smith has put together a talk for you and about what's going on with the families. They had a meeting Thursday night, and I'm sure we have updates. After that, we have community education with Barbara Burns and then the REAP group I will speak about. And then we will get a final update from the end of a grant funded program that has been housed in the probation department. And then we'll answer questions and in the that are in the chat. So kind of that's our agenda for the day. At this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Burstein um, to start our day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all had a, a nice uh, long weekend for many of you. So uh, what I'm going to do today is first is start off on uh, presenting our updates on our um, opioid overdose deaths and the epidemiology uh, behind them. Next, please. So um, here, let me talk about the opioid related overdose deaths. So unfortunately, this is a slide that you're probably all too familiar with looking at the number of opioid related overdose deaths in, in Erie County from, um, from the past 10 years, 2012 to 2022. And if you recall, we, oh, could um, people mute uh, their lines if they're not speaking, please. Thanks. Uh, not everybody's muted. Um, so uh, if you recall, uh, we reached our peak in 2016 with 301 opioid deaths. Somebody's not muted here, folks. Carolyn Grisco, I think I heard the sounds coming from you. If you can mute, please, thanks. Let me see if I can mute her. Okay, how's thanks. that? Sounds good. Okay. Clear, uh, and then um, is it because of the work of this great task force, we were able to bring down our overdose uh, death numbers to 156, so about half. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and you know, new challenges arose, and uh, as you'll see, like a different a new population um, started using. And our numbers have increased and continue to increase. Uh, um, last year, we unfortunately there were 286 opioid related overdose deaths in Erie County. So far this year, um, we've documented 182 opioid related overdose deaths, and there are uh, at 106 cases pending. Um, in particular, October and the first part of November have been especially deadly months. There, um, in October, there were 42 opioid-related overdose um, deaths that were suspected. They haven't been confirmed yet, but there were 42 suspected opioid-related overdose deaths that came to the medical examiner's office. And so far this year, there, I'm sorry, so far this month in November, there have been 13. And um, well, that is a, as of a Friday, so there could have been more that came in over the weekend. So, um, so this is, again, it's, uh, it's very deadly out there. There's, there's like some product that is, is much more toxic than people realize. It may be um, sold as cocaine or mixed with cocaine and people don't really know what it is. Uh, so, um, you know, just people just really need to be careful if, you know, you could spread the word with your colleagues and, and uh, they can let their clients know to, um, you know, especially that maybe their, your, their client, your clients can inform their peers that may be still using, or maybe your clients are still using a little bit that, that uh, there is a product that is very, very deadly right now in our community and people have to be really careful. Next, please. 
Oh, Cheryl, could I have the next slide, please? Thanks. So, um, so this is so. Let's start to talk about the epidemiology of our opioid-related overdose death victims. So, this is these are data uh, looking at our um, from 2015 to 2022, the Erie County opioid-related deaths by age. Where is uh, Aqua starts off in 2015, and then um, ending off um, it goes by year, and then ending off in 2022. That cases that we have confirmed so far in light blue. And so, if you can visually you could see that in um, the you know the earlier years, like the first um, several bars, uh, the um, the bars were highest in the youngest age group, people in their twenties and thirties. And as we um, and then since the pandemic from twenty twenty to through twenty twenty two, you see that those uh, younger bar younger age bars are lower, and we're starting to see an increase, a rise. In the bars for uh, you know, people who are middle aged and older. So um, let's take a little bit closer look at that, please. Next slide. So um, this is comparing the uh, Erie County uh, Census data on the left hand, the numbers in the left hand column, um, by um, looking at different demographics of race, ethnicity, gender, and age of our opioid overdose death victims from 2018 in the second column with percentages all the way to uh, 2021 on um, on the right hand side. And so uh, so you can see that the demographics of our overdose death victims have changed in terms of race, ethnicity, and age um, from before the pandemic to compare to after the pandemic. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to um, let you know, if there's a typo, the last column should be 2022, not 2021. So there's a typo on my part. And those are the um, deaths that have, overdose deaths that have been confirmed so far. So you can see um, just with the race ethnicity, um, before the pandemic, um, our overdose death victims were uh, primarily uh, white. And uh, and um, we had um, a, a very little uh, involvement in uh, people of color in our community. And you can see, uh, fast forward to 2022, that um, those data have changed a little bit, that there has been a, um, a decrease in the proportion of overdose death victims who are categorized as white from 79% in 2018 to um, 69% in 2022. And then uh, our uh, other race ethnicities, <clears throat> unfortunately, have started to increase. And so, for example, blacks uh, or African Americans went from 10% uh, of our overdose death, opioid overdose death victims in 2018 to 27%, so two and a half times more uh, in, um, in 2022. And also, uh, with just want to point out with uh, Native American, Alaska Natives, um, we started to look at death certificates to uh, to confirm the race ethnicity of our overdose death victims and through that we've been able to um to identify that there are of course african american uh, sorry native americans elective natives who are overdose death victims in our community and then we've also seen um an a small smaller increase of uh, people categorized as hispanic from 7% in 2018 to 11% of our opioid overdose death victims in 2022 so you can see that the uh, demographic Graphics have changed a little bit of our overdose death victims. It's turned as in terms of gender, you know, that hasn't really changed. Of uh, you can see on the left hand column that about 50% of our Erie County population is female and about 50% is male. And it's persisted um, throughout the pandemic that the majority of our overdose death victims are males. It doesn't mean that females aren't using, it's just um, females are more um, are able, more easy. Uh, easily able to, uh, since more females are more likely to be insured and have different health seeking behaviors compared to males, are more likely to obtain uh, prescription narcotic medication. And, you know, those aren't spiked with fentanyl or, or fentanyl analogs, whereas um, males are less likely to be insured in general and uh, so more likely to um, purchase uh, um, um, medication or drugs on the street. And so that is, we know almost all of it is uh, spiked with fentanyl. And so we're seeing more deaths among the male population. Just moving down to age. Again, you can see that the uh, demographics of our opioid related overdose death victims has changed and by age, just we're starting to see an older population, you know, people in their uh, um, middle aged and, and older. So looking at the 20s, people in their um, 20 to 29 year olds, 
Uh, you can see at the beginning of the pandemic, 29% um, of our opioid related overdose death victims were in their 20s compared to 14% of the entire population. Whereas in 2022, that's decreased to 16%. And our older age groups have uh, have I know, started to see an increase where people in their 40s just want to highlight, you know, that's a big change. Um, whereas in 2018, they um, they consisted of uh, 18, uh, for, so 14 percent of our overdose death victims. And in 2022, so far, they uh, counted for 26 percent. And people in their 50s and 60s um, has, and above have um, also increased in uh, 2022 compared to 2018 in terms of the proportion of opioid related overdose death victims. So in general, we're seeing. Of, um, well, and I mean, it's at any any population. Their overdose death victims, and so we're seeing a. Uh, and of more, um, you know, people of color and. Uh, uh, plus and, and older adults uh, compared. Next, please. Oh, Cheryl, if I could have the next slide, please. Who's ever moving the slides? It should be there, Gail. Uh, it, um, we'll see the, the same graph. Huh. Let me try to go I'm back. Okay. You seeing it? So um, these are data that you've also seen before, looking at the uh, percent of Erie County opioid related over by residents from 2016 to what we have confirmed so far. So the uh, um, blue correspond uh, overdose death victims who resided in the city of Buffalo. I think the proportion that that live resided at the, in suburban areas, uh, the uh, uh, green are the proportion that resided in rural areas, and the purple are the proportion that um, we didn't have a good address or they resided outside of Erie County. And so you can see the general trend is we're seeing a trend of um, an increase of of um, overdose death victims who have uh, resided in Buffalo. However. You know, we're still seeing a significant amount of our overdose death victims that reside in all the different suburbs of Erie County and all the different rural areas. So this is still a problem you know, throughout Erie County. Next, please. And then this is um, this graph is also is looking at the percent of Erie County opioid related overdose deaths by type of opioid. So there, you know, there are many, many different uh, types of opioids. So we're just categorizing in four um, different categories. So um, the first category is fentanyl related. The second category is fentanyl related and, and no heroin. The second category is heroin related and no fentanyl. The third category is fentanyl and heroin. And the fourth category is other opioids where there's no fentanyl and no heroin, but there are, there are other opioids. And just remember that these are all polysubstance uh, overdoses. So there's, um, for uh, all these overdoses had more than just opioids, unfortunately, identified in their tox screen. But right now, we're just uh, focusing on the opioids. Because again, there, I, know, I think there's still a big belief that heroin is killing people. And I think you can see from, from this graph that the, the overwhelming majority of our opioid related overdose deaths have uh, are the tox screen have fentanyl, either fentanyl without heroin or um, fentanyl with heroin. But there is a very, very small proportion that have uh, her, her, are of our overdose death victims that in their tox screen are found heroin without any fentanyl. And actually so far in 2022, among our uh, confirmed opioid overdose death victims, 93% of all the overdoses had talk, had fentanyl in their talk. I am on a Zoom call. That's why I couldn't take your oh, Anne, And can you please mute? And Roar, can you please mute? I muted her. I got Thanks. it. Thanks. Um, so you can see that, that you know, again, um, I think we have to just assume that everything is, uh, uh, you know, all the substances on the street 
uh, even if it's, you know, cocaine, you think of buying cocaine or cannabis or meth or, you know, any, anything is, um, is, is, is spiked with fentanyl. And uh, that's why it's really important if people are using that um, they really take the harm reduction me me uh, measures with uh, having Narcan on hand, you know, not using alone and um, not using at the same time. So um, you can have like a, a, you know, a buddy that can watch you and resuscitate you and also using the fentanyl test strips just to see if there is fentanyl and then how much there is and then, um, you know, changing your use accordingly. Next, please. And so, as you know, I mentioned that uh, that we're you know we're seeing a lot of um, of uh, fentanyl mixed with uh, other other illicit substances. So, really, what we're seeing a lot in our community is uh, is cocaine and fentanyl mixed together. So, I think people are purchasing cocaine and they think they're using cocaine, and they don't even realize that there's fentanyl spiked in the substance. So, this is looking at the percent of our Erie County opioid related deaths that have both fentanyl and cocaine in the tox screens. And so these are all the different, you know, fentanyl uh, analogs. And, uh, and you can see that um, the percentage has increased pretty significantly, where so far of all the confirmed overdose deaths, uh, 50 uh, opioid-related overdose deaths, over half, 54%, have evolved both uh, cocaine and uh, opioids. And again, like people don't, you know, if they've been uh, using cocaine and it's been spiked with fentanyl, um, you know, they'll, they they may feel like they're developing these cravings for um, to use more cocaine, but it's it's probably really they've become addicted to um, and and uh, developed an opioid use disorder with the, with the fentanyl spiked. In the cocaine. So if um, if you know if you can help spread the word that if if people who think that they're using cocaine or, or and they um, start to feel that they're um, they're developing these like cravings and then also withdrawal symptoms um, with the cocaine, it's it's probably not from the cocaine. It, there's probably fentanyl involved, and they need to ensure that they're using the harm reduction measures and also um, and look to get treatment. Next, please. So, I um, just want to give you um, just a little a brief update um, on the healthcare provider education and, and policy reform. So, um, uh, um, thanks to um, Cheryl working with Congressman Brian Higgins' office, we received a, a $1 million grant for one year. And what that will do is uh, um, uh, cover the um, the costs of uh, peer-based uh, support services in the offices that aren't covered by insurance. We know that peer-based support can be very helpful to uh, anybody in, in treatment, including in primary care. And so this will allow uh, physicians' offices to um, to hire uh, uh, peers and to work in their offices, and then um, you know during that one year, in order for this to be sustainable, work with the health plans to see um, how this can be reimbursed. And now with the um, the um, 115, 1115 Medicaid waiver, it may be easier to accomplish this. But this is you know a moving target. So hopefully we can uh, figure out this out uh, to um, with our, the offices that we're working with to figure out um, how this can be a sustainable project and uh, the peers can be reimbursed in the private physicians or offices and in the FQHCs and uh, be able to um, you know, continue after this one year period. Next, please. So uh, that's all I have for now. And I guess I'll um, see you in uh, maybe um, in, uh, at the end of the conference for, um, for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Burstein. We appreciate it. Kind of sobering statistics that we have here. Um, I'll turn it over to Jen, um, who's going to give us an update on what the treatment providers are up to. Jen, are you with us? There you are. Yeah. And let me get your slides up for you. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jen Seib. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Integration for Best Self. Um, and I also co chair the, uh, the uh, treatment provider task force or work group uh, with John Rico. Um, so we can just jump to the next slide. Um, this is just an overview of our, our work group for those that may not be familiar. So our work group meets monthly. Um, it consists of uh, representation from treatment providers, prevention, um, people in the community kind of doing, doing that work. 
and so we welcome you to join us there. Next slide. So we have uh, three committees currently in the work group. So there's an increased access to SUD housing. Um, as we know, housing is a critical critical need for, for many people. Um, oh, I see that uh, I'm being asked to speak louder. I'm not sure. I'll try to move a little closer to my, my computer, see if that helps. Um, and then increase access to MAT and community with focus on primary care and then education and training. Can folks hear me okay? Is this better? Mm -hmm. It's much okay. better. Thank you. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is um, so the, the the facilitator of the increased access to SUD housing is John Greco. He he um, leads that committee. You can see there's a lot of um, a lot of things um, on 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 the slide that are going on, which is really great stuff. So. Just a few updates of what's happening with housing, uh, living opportunities of DePaul. They've committed um, to include six beds dedicated for SUD. So that's great. They're looking to break ground very soon. And John may have uh, more information on that if there's questions. I think John is um, on today. Um, uh, updates from Best Self and Evergreen that are including um, more, more housing. So Mount Aaron project with 18 units of SUD. Um, and uh, so, and that's that was filled as of 1024. And Evergreen has the um, seven of 12 transitional supportive housing beds are filled. Um, and then, lastly, the Push Buffalo collaborating with Best Self on a project entitled West Side Homes. So, that's going to help increase more housing for people with SUD and SMI. So, very exciting stuff going on there. Next slide. So this is a really great, um, so Juliana um, Everdyke is leading this committee, the Harm Reduction Education and Support. They've been a very active committee and doing lots of great stuff. I'm always excited to hear the updates. Um, so you can see on the slide here, they're working on a fact sheet um, that takes a, a medical model approach. So really wanting to um, just kind of normalize what, what goes on. People go to their doctors, they get little pamphlets or handouts about diabetes, about, you know, lots of other things. So we just want to kind of get that information out there around SUD, hopefully, you know, working on anti-stigma, as we know, is a huge challenge for people having access to care. Um, so normalizing harm reduction um, practices, They um, some of the information sheets will also focus on how a conversation with a loved one about substance use could take place, a uh, plan to address what harm reduction looks like with a variety of substances. Um, and then, and so and not just opioids, because that, you know, obviously we know opioids is a huge challenge. And at the same time, we know people, even just from what Dr. Burstein was just talking about, people are using all kinds of substances, not even sure what they're getting or what that looks like. So we really wanna make sure people um, are aware and then um, just hoping to uh, collaborate with community coalitions that already have a presence. So, you know, how do we leverage people who are already in spaces where they're trusted and we can share information? So that group's doing really great stuff. Um, next slide. Um, this one I actually am the, the have been chairing and it's kind of been on a hiatus. <laughs> so um, this is a challenging group. To, uh, challenging, well, the group is great, but the, the challenge is trying to um, to really do this work, which is how do we improve access to medication assisted treatment in the community with a particular focus on primary care. So we've been, you know, we've shared about those challenges in past um, meetings and we've been kind of on a hiatus. Hopefully we'll come back together and, and have some, some new fresh ideas. So more to come with that. Uh, next slide. Oh, actually, and before I, I just wanted to say, I'm going to um, turn this one over to Juliana, but before um, I, I, one thing I did want to mention out of our, our work group, we also have a small group of us that are working with um, the unified court system when trying to figure out how we can better partner our treatment providers and then those that are maybe involved in drug courts um, and how we can be better uh, collaborating and ensuring that um, you know, treatment needs are being met and also the needs for people who are under supervision, like that's working out. So really trying to, and we're looking forward to in the beginning of the year, having 
um, as some kind of like training or um, dialogue that we'll have. So we're looking forward to that. That's something we're working on um, in the, out of this work group. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Juliana, who's going to talk about um, this this award that she she knows way more about it than me. So go ahead, Juliana. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the Department of Mental Health uh, got awarded a, a BJA grant um, for adult drug court. And so there's some, some facts on the page here and I have some other uh, information too. So it's a, a $1 million project. Um, so 750 coming from the Bureau of Justice Assistance um, and then a match from the Department of Mental Health as well as um, the Research Foundation and University of Buffalo. Um, so the focus is to serve the 8th Judicial District of, of Adult Drug Treatment Courts, which um, encompasses um, the City of Buffalo, City of Tonawanda, Cheektowaga, Amherst, and Lancaster. Uh, so the, the hope is and our goals right, are to increase the availability of case management services, reduce the time it takes to link with a treatment agency, and initiate medication-assisted treatment. Um, improve retention in medication assisted treatment um, and focusing on those highest highest risk drug court participants. Um, so the the intervention that is being used by the Hope of Erie County through the research through University of Buffalo and the Research Foundation, it's called Mission CJ. Um, so there currently is a variety of mission um, intervention models that are being used throughout Erie County right now. Um, and what it focuses on, well, and the acronym is listed there, so uh, maintaining independence and sobriety through systems integration, outreach, and networking. Um, so this is an evidence-based model, and it focuses on including case management services, peer support, uh, critical time intervention, dual recovery therapy, vocational support, and trauma-informed care, as well as utilizing um, MAT linkage if needed. Um, so the program will establish as, as well a trauma screening for the drug courts specifically um, and then training on that for the drug courts and, and also what the impacts of trauma are uh, for their participants. Um, the goal is that we'll serve 30 new cases a year and um, that's for four years. Um, so 120 um, new cases through this grant is our goal. Um, they, did go to so the Department of Mental Health went uh, this past Thursday, the 10th to the legislature to get approval um, and going forward now kind of next steps is to meet with Department of Mental Health representatives, as well as the program representatives to kind of figure out the plan for moving forward. Um, so we are uh, doing that this week. So we will have more info about start dates and what we're looking at and how the program will run out or if you you know, roll out, um, or if you hear about it, um, we can provide updates as we go along. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and then on the next slide, you're actually, I'm going to ask um, Chief Dina to, um, there's a funky one in there always. <laughs> um, so he's going to just uh, hop on and, and talk to us a bit more about how the um, MAT or MOUD um, services are going within the sheriff's office. Uh, good morning. Thanks, John, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, the MAT program in the jail continues to do really well. Uh, we started back in July uh, with maintaining folks on a uh, on a verified prescription with medication assisted treatment in the facility. Uh, and uh, since October 7th, we have also been doing induction. So getting people started or restarted on the medication when they are uh, screened out by medical to be eligible. So currently we have 69 total enrollees. Uh, 45 of those are on Suboxone. Uh, 15 are on Methadone. <clears throat> Two are uh, on Sublocade. And then we also have seven who are in counseling only. So they've been determined not to be eligible for MAT, um, but they're still availing themselves of the counseling opportunities that we have as a component of the program. Um, so of those 69, uh, I'm sorry, we have 50, I gotta do some quick math in my head because I didn't total them up. Uh, 58 are males, 
33 of which are housed on one single housing area where we provide the bulk of the programming. Uh, the other 25 are housed elsewhere throughout the facility, um, basically by virtue of either security classifications, a mental health designation, or unfortunately, we're still dealing with COVID within the jails. So there are those that are still quarantined uh, as a precautionary measure or uh, as a confirmed case. Uh, we have 11 females in the program. Uh, the bulk of which are housed in a single area. And then we have, again, several housed elsewhere just uh, for those same considerations. So a typical day uh, in the MAT program for an enrollee is uh, basically 8 a.m. Medication pass comes up to the housing area. Uh, it includes a check-in with the nurse to see how folks are reacting to the medication. Uh, we have a very robust diversion uh, protocol uh, in place that occurs at the time of med pass and for one hour afterwards. Uh, group therapy is conducted by our case managers on the main housing area twice per week, and that is facilitated by best self. Uh, so they will do that Tuesdays and Thursdays from nine o'clock until approximately 1030, give or take. Um, one of the limitations with COVID is we are not commingling folks from different housing areas. So the plan is uh, when we are hopefully uh, finally through COVID to bring the folks that are safely able to be commingled um, up to the main housing area for group. But in the meantime, our case managers are kind of just checking in with them individually um, on their housing areas or in a designated location. But we're just trying to avoid uh, commingling folks from different housing areas because if one of them gets COVID, in a group session on our main housing area and brings it back to their housing area, then we've got a real problem on our hands within the jail. Um, so uh, lunch is anywhere around 11 o'clock to 1115. Uh, then the facility locks down for a mid shift head count from noon to one. Uh, the afternoon involves recreation, other uh, housing area operations, and then we uh, lock down for shift change at 230. Uh, dinner comes up roughly 445. And then our peer counseling groups, which are facilitated by Save the Michaels, occur twice per week uh, on Wednesdays and Thursdays from about 6.30 to 7.45 p.m. And then they do a supplemental group on Saturday mornings at 9.30. Um, and again, same as with the case managers, the folks that are not housed on the main housing area are able to have access to their peer counselors on a one-to-one -one basis throughout the course of the week. So uh, when an individual is set to be released, either from a period of a, a local sentence or released on bail, released by order of the court or any other, uh, any other release mechanism, uh, they are all required to meet with a registered nurse in the booking area before they go out the door. So we have a process in place where when we are uh, processing the release for an enrolled MAT participant, the booking deputy will make a call up to correctional health, advise them they have a client who is in the process of being released, and a nurse will come downstairs with a packet of information for those folks. Uh, they also receive a Narcan kit as provided by Cheryl and her team, um, but they'll be given uh, information regarding, regarding post-release linkage to services. We make them aware of the service link stop right around the corner uh, and basically do everything we can to ensure that they're going to continue out into the community. Um, an interesting note is we are getting all of our methadone through best self uh, as a guest dosing uh, procedure. So they have the opportunity to either return to their home clinic or continue with best self uh, upon their release. Uh, lastly, uh, you know, as everyone knows, this is required by legislation. So uh, every county jail in New York state is um, regulated by the New York State Commission of Correction. Uh, their team was on site about six weeks ago to evaluate our program, and uh, they came away extremely impressed. Uh, we were ahead of the curve with respect to our counterparts in New York State, and uh, they were uh, surprised at, at how comprehensive our program was and what we had in place uh, for the clients. Um, and I think there was a question in the chat that I didn't quite catch. Uh, I'll pull them all up at the end. Okay. I'll pull them all up at the end time. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. That, that's all I have. Thank you.
Thank you so much for everything. That's exciting what's happening. It's amazing. Long time coming. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. I think I and thank you very much. And I think I just have a couple slides left. So this one um, is just related to um, mm -hmm. uh, methadone maintenance currently. So, you know, I think one of the the there was a huge drop in wait lists. We can see, um, you know, recently and now it looks like it's coming back up again. Um, but I just think that that's a, um, you know, just kind of an interesting look at where we're at. And I do if, if people aren't aware, I know best self and Elba DeVita, I think I'm not sure if anyone else were awarded um, funding for mobile um, mm -hmm. mobile methadone units. So I know I can I I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Elba DeVita, but I've talked to them. I've talked to Liz there, and um, I think we're we're all looking at probably sometime um, next year when we'll have those. Obviously, vehicles take a while to get, so that's kind of a there's a hold up there, but. Um, very, very excited um, to be able to offer that in the near future. Um, this is just a, a reminder. We talk about this. We've talked about this before, but um, we have a regional. There was a regional grant, uh, SAMHSA grant awarded. That is uh, several partners, which is Best Self, um, uh, New York Matters, UBMD, Value Network, um, and several others, all partnering to provide 24/7 access to medication assisted treatment or medication for opioid use disorder. Um, this is a completely virtual platform. So anyone anywhere in Western New York can call this number, then can be linked um, via, via Zoom to uh, meet with a provider um, who will be evaluated and if appropriate, given a prescription and then um, referral to any, any other place that they wanna continue to receive care. Um, it opened on May 16th, and on the next slide, you can see kind of what we've been able to do so far. Um, so this was as of uh, about a week and a half ago, so these numbers probably are a little different now, but there's 138 unique individuals have called the program to get access to medication. Um, you can see 60 were from Erie County and 52 from Niagara. That's definitely where we're seeing the bulk of the calls coming, but we have had calls from Allegheny, Wyoming, Orleans, Genesee, Chautauqua, and Cattaraugus, um, anywhere from one to eight. So, um, you know, per county. So I think that's really great because that's an increase. We didn't have all those counties yet um, the last time I did the report out. So words getting out there and people are accessing it, which is great. Um, and then you can see the list there, the people who have called that these are the programs that they've been referred to for on ongoing care. And again, these are self-selected by the caller. And so they they tell us where they wanna go and we help them get linked to, to that place. Next slide. Oh, and then as a reminder, we also have our um, Erie County Addiction Hotline um, also available. And um, so you can see some information there, the, the call volume uh, 656 through September of 2022. Um, and so they're also available to help. And I think that is all I have. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you so much. On that, I'm gonna turn this over to Katie and Kaylee who are gonna give us an update about matters. Um, exciting stuff happening there. Are you guys thank ready? You so much. Let's see. Sorry, I'm just playing with my buttons here real quick. Okay, just let me know when you're ready. I got your first slide up. Okay, perfect. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Katie. Um, I'm here with Kaylee, as well as a few members of the Matters team. Next slide. So expansion efforts. We continue to grow. Uh, we continue to expand our referral and receiving sites, our partnership with EMS and corrections agencies, uh, and so forth. Now, Kaylee is regularly meeting with our regional care coordinators, which we're finding is very helpful in making those local meaningful connections with their partners. Next slide. So this is our current footprint. We currently have over 135 referral sites, 185 receiving clinics, and 1,000 pharmacies for our voucher program. Next slide. 
So as the program continues to grow, as you can imagine, so must the team. So I joined uh, the team in October to provide direct support for the administrative team in Buffalo, as well as oversight for the entire Matters Network. To give you an idea of how I ended up here, I went to undergrad and graduate school here in Buffalo with a focus on health and wellness. I started working in healthcare in 2012 and discovered a passion for complex medical operations. I went on to work in various outpatient settings across multiple specialties, leading teams from the front lines on up to management um, for organizations spanning multiple locations in states. In addition to myself, we are very happy to have two public health fellows, Bridget and Lauren, working with us from the Department of Health. They're going to introduce themselves real quick. Hi, everyone. My name is Bridget. Um, I'm currently in my last year of my MPH at Damon University. I am expected to graduate in May, and I'm really excited to get experience in my field before graduating and excited to be a part of the team. Same thing. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a public health fellow. I'm in my last semester of undergrad at Buffalo, majoring in public health. And I'm also very excited to be a part of this team. Thank you, Bridget and Lauren. So we recently launched a Matters app, which we're very excited about. Uh, the goal of providing partners an easier way to complete the referral process, as well as offering patients quick access to resources. So for example, rather than staff needing to find a desktop in a busy emergency department, they can download the app and be linked right to the referral platform. In addition, patients can request telemed referrals, fentanyl test strips, as well as um, have access to regional specific resources um, right from their phone. Next slide. Here's the QR codes to download the app. And then Kaylee is going to go over some of our telemed services. All right, great. Thank you, Katie. Cheryl, you can go to the next slide. So we're just going to touch briefly um, on a few of our telemedicine initiatives. Next slide, please. So we're super excited about the progress of the Matt Padoa hotline. I know that Jen briefly touched on this as well, uh, but the Matt Padoa hotline is a 24-7 MAT hotline. Um, a patient can simply call the phone number on the screen right here. Um, they're rapidly connected to a telemedicine provider, depending on the time of day. They're evaluated, given a buprenorphine prescription if appropriate, and then they're referred to treatment through the Matos platform. So they'll also have access to all of the regular services that are offered within the Matters platform. So that medication voucher, if they're uninsured, the transportation voucher uh, via Uber Health, which is available to everybody referred through the platform, and then also that peer referral if they're interested. Next slide, please. So we also have a similar initiative going on with various police departments, peer organizations, outreach organizations all across Western New York. Uh, the professional who is working with the patient simply calls the telemedicine coordinator phone number. The patient is connected to a provider, evaluated, given a buprenorphine prescription if appropriate. Um, and then again, they're connected to treatment through the Matters platform. So pretty much the same um, process, just a little bit different um, of a program. We're also always looking to partner with new police departments. Um, so if your department might be interested, definitely contact me. My email address is right on the screen there and we can get you set up. Next slide, please. So lastly, we just wanted to touch on a new project that we've been working on. Next slide, please. So we've been distributing fentanyl test strips all across New York State to hospitals, clinics, and directly to patients as well. So far, we've distributed more than 30,000 test strips. So orders can simply be placed through our website. You just have to complete a short form. Um, as long as you're a partner within the Matters platform, you're welcome to order for your hospital or your clinic. And then any patient across New York State can also order test strips for themselves and we can ship them directly to any address. Next slide, please. So here's just a link to the website to place the fentanyl test strip order. So you can scan that QR code if you're interested or also just type in the URL there right at the bottom. But that's it for the matters updates today. So thank you all for being here and please reach out with any questions that you might have. Thank you both so much. Um, exciting programs. 
cool stuff going on there. Um, on that, I'll move into my work group. Um, so interestingly enough, um, we've been the naloxone work group from the beginning of the task force formation, but we've really changed because we realized our work is harm reduction. We do far more than naloxone. It was interesting that you brought up the fentanyl test strips um, from county health department. We've also distributed, oh gosh, I can't even tell you, there's gotta be about 40,000 test strips in just Tenere County in the past six months. So on that note, um, be aware that the, that service is out there between matters, the county health department. We heard Dr. Burstein talk about everything being cut with fentanyl, critical service we have here. So uh, Narcan trainings and deployment continue. This is the Office of Harm Reduction overall. And I'm sure there's more. I'm sure there's some I missed. The numbers are huge. Uh, we have trained a lot of partners as trainers also. We really appreciate you as trainers. Um, give us about a week to get your supplies together when you're doing a training. That's the only thing I ask. We've had some people ask like day of. Um, this is getting the message out there. It's getting the tool out there in the community that needs to be out there, as you can see. We do a lot of mailings. We do a lot of virtual trainings today. Text for Narcan is huge. There's wall units. Some of the other team will talk more about that for you. So under the ESAP project out of our office, which is the expanded syringe access program, we continue to collect a lot of old medications and dispose of them and old drugs and dispose of them, as well as distribute clean harm reduction supplies. Um, people really need to be met where they are at. We talked about stigma. This is really about breaking down the stigma. We need to meet people where they're at on their terms in their journey so that they can stay as healthy as they possibly can. So under the ESAP program, we've been doing a lot of drug disposal and needle disposal to get the access out in the community. You can get rid of old sharps, you can get rid of old needles at any of these sites in the community. The kiosks look like this picture here. I want everyone to be aware of what they look like. They're kind of like an oversized mailbox. They're well labeled. One is for drugs, one is for old needles and old sharps of any kind. Um, we're carrying, collecting a lot of old medication. Um, if I can get this to move forward to show you, it's kind of crazy. Looking at the number of drugs and needles we've destroyed over the years, um, starting in 2019, where a lot of prescribing was going on. And I think as a community, this shows that we're doing better with prescribing. We're prescribing less because we have less garbage to get rid of. In 2019, we had a plethora. I mean, we had almost 35,000 pounds of old meds that we destroyed in a year. 2020, that did go down. 2021, down again. 2022, so far this year, we've destroyed about, as you can see, four tons of meds, which is significantly a lower amount. Whether prescribing is decreasing, patients are more educated as to what we ask for and what we accept. Then we also look at sharps collected in our community. This has stayed pretty consistent. We do know that um, outside of substance use disorder, and we talk about people utilizing syringes, um, the majority of syringes are not used for that. They're used for things like diabetes care. They're used for things like growth hormones. And giving people the appropriate place to dispose of them, critical. We've replaced four kiosks this year, and we've placed three new ones out in the community. If you know of places in the community where these need to be, please let us know. There is no cost to the host site, and we'll get them out there. Um, you can access these on the pointny.org. This is the QR code that is out there. It's on the information. There's never a question asked when people want to dispose of things. If people need sharps containers to get rid of things appropriately, they can also contact us. Many of the sites that are manned by people have those containers on site, and we try to make sure that they're there. So people have the right tools. Uh, harm reduction outreach continues. We've gone to new re places um, due to isolation, disconnection from public interactions, new homeless populations in the community. We've been responsive to our partners when they reach out to us. We're really trying to meet people in their own place. Bring, asking people to come to us doesn't work so well, we've learned. And in this epidemic, particularly, the isolation is critical, the stigma attached to it and the loss that we've seen. We're doing pop-up community events as requested by the community. We continue outreach to social venues such as bars and restaurants due to the changing drugs and the overdose profiles. Um, we're starting some really new kind of cool things going on. We're going to be doing some Narcan trainings and availabilities in the music venues such as town ballroom, some of the bars while clients are there. They've invited us in to get the tool 
the Narcan in people's hands, as well as the fentanyl test strips, and also offer that connection to folks on their terms and their social environment. Our Livewell Erie van is out every week. It's every Tuesday downtown here for curbside care. We offer a plethora of services. Thursdays, we are at the St. John Canty Church parking lot on the corner of Broadway and Swineburn. And Fridays, we are in assorted places. So to give you an idea of curbside care, I kind of threw that out there. These are the types of services offered. Um, it's consistent. We've learned consistency in a place is critical for clients. They know where we are. They can come back for help when they want it. If we need to offer more services and they ask them for us, we also know what they're asking for. So we're three days a week, steady places. The other days we are doing pop-ups. We're available for input. We like partners to join us. Um, just reach out and let us know there. We greatly appreciate your, part, your participation. On that note, I am going to turn this over to Elizabeth to give you her final update on our response after overdose project. Uh, we had a grant for the past four years with SAMHSA. We've done some really unique things in the community, and I can't thank you enough for leading this, Elizabeth. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. So after four years, this grant is over. This was our regional grant um, for our regional activities throughout the full Western New York area. Next slide, please. So for the four years, um, we ended up training 69 first responder departments. That's over 1,000 first responders. You can see the breakdown below, law enforcement, over 50 fire departments, um, including about 1,500 community members. We also trained individual organizations and um, did many train the trainer sessions so that we could have trainers in the other counties and the, the other areas. Um, and many took us up on that, about 450 um, also trained through outreach and case management. Next slide, please. Our wall box program, about 1,600 wall boxes have been distributed in the community so far, and that accounts for over 5,400 Narcan kits through that program. Next slide is a graph showing this. So we have wall boxes and Narcan kits distributed by year. The red line are wall boxes, the blue line are Narcan kits. And you can see that this program is getting out an exponential number of Narcan kits. So we're seeing that the wall box program is a good way to get Narcan kits distributed in the community. Next slide, please. Our text for Narcan program started in July of 2020, and so far we have over 4,000 Narcan kits have been distributed in 3,600 individual mailings. Please continue to get the word out about this program. The more people know about it, the, the more they'll use it. Next slide, please. And again, we can see the breakdown by year of the number of Narcan kits mailed through the tax program. So we can see the program is growing um, and we want it to continue to grow. Next slide, please. So a shout out to all of our peers in recovery um, here at the county, as well as in our full Western New York region. Our COPE group continues strong. Um, so we are meeting about twice a year all Western New York peers are welcome. We do a training and skills building. We have opportunities for networking and support and self-care. Um, and this picture shows um, one of our peers, Antonio, teaching us um, about drums. And we also had a networking activity in there. Next slide, please. Through this grant, we also work to disseminate um, our lessons learned and some of our activities. With our evaluators from UB, we were able to publish two papers. The first um, is our peer um, paper through the journal Substance Use and Misuse, and the evaluators were able to conduct qualitative interviews with peers from the community, and they reported on coping strategies and workplace supports for peers. Our second paper um, was published in the Journal of Paramedic Practice, and it was on our Narcan training. Specifically, um, we were administering pre and post surveys to 
measure the um, change in attitudes and knowledge. And I recently presented at the APHA, the American Public Health Association Conference on naloxone being first aid in our lessons learned from our wall box program and our text for Narcan program. So as we close out this grant, um, we have been able to train other trainers um, in other areas of um, the region, and so they continue to provide trainings. We've been able to get New York State to continue to supply Narcan for the full region through our office. And so those other counties, those other trainers are still able to do their work and we're still able to provide support. So we're always there for them to provide any sort of support or technical assistance that they need. So thank you to everyone who um, helped in this process and who helped get our lessons learned and spread our activities beyond our county um, into our full region. Thank you very much. And on that, I'm going to jump to Healing Communities and ask Teller to give us a final update on Healing Communities. We've closed out a couple of projects here, and you're hearing the final updates on them. Thank you, Taylor. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, as most of you know, we did initiate a lot of the telemedicine um, program through the Healing Community Study. Um, we were able to get that off the ground throughout the, the life of the study. Um, a total of 104 referrals have been successfully made. 90 um, telemedicine visits were completed. So, there is, it's a little bit lower. Um, some of that was just registration error. Some of it was some no calls. Um, some people didn't have access to uh, any cell phone or a computer to complete their appointment. Um, and since the beginning, we have been able to successfully troubleshoot majority of that. Uh, and Kaylee did kind of touch on a little bit of their troubleshooting on their end as well earlier in the uh, meeting. Um, we've had uh, 78 BUP uh, prescriptions prescribed. So that is really great. We were able to successfully initiate 78 persons on some type of prescription for a period of time while they wait for their follow-up appointment. Um, and so we had successfully uh, 75 follow-ups scheduled. And the great thing about that is that um, these persons were able to choose whatever treatment agency that they wanted to choose um, that participates with the MATTERS program. And then our office, our peers are able to follow up with them, make sure that they got into that appointment, had any issues, can transition to another program if, um, if that's needed. You can go to the next slide, Cheryl. As Elizabeth mentioned, we are still pushing Narcana's first aid and harm reduction. So we are still getting our first aid kits out, which are um, unfortunately missing right now. We've been out of them for a little bit, but we should be getting a new order in. Um, we do continue to have people ask us about the first aid kit. So this seems to be um, have been a very successful initiative um, and the community is now very, uh, they're trained to know that we are going to give Narcan and a first aid kit as well, which is pretty positive. You can go to the next slide. We are still doing curbside care. Um, if everybody remembers, it was about this time that we thought about curbside care. I believe mid-December was our first curbside event um, in our 19 degree weather. Um, but since, since that, for about a year or about 11 months, um, we have handed out over 4,500 Narcan kits. So this is the, um, the box with the two doses, okay? Not everyone gets a box with two doses of Narcan. Um, if they identify that maybe they live in an area where they're concerned um, or possibly um, they have a loved one or they work in, in some place, um, then they can give take a box and we'll give them whatever they want. Um, but we have also provided 4,300 first aid kits with that one dose of Narcan. Um, everybody does walk away with at least that first aid kit so that they can keep in their backpack, their purse, their car, um, whatever is most convenient for them. Fentanyl test strips, um, over 3,000. Safer injection supplies, over 6,000. Um, that roughly equates to about 600 in, uh, units um, in kits. And then we have had a total of 100, over 100 events in the last 11 months, uh, which is pretty incredible. And we are uh, beyond uh, packing our schedules full. So 
So um, we are going to continue curbside care. We are looking at a few different models, potentially different areas, um, and we have learned a lot over the last year. You can go to the next slide, Cheryl. Here is an example of our uh, restaurant program. So this is a picture of the paper bags. Fentanyl may be in your knockoff pills, cocaine, crack, meth, other street drugs, um, carry Narcan, and then we do have the text for Narcan line. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So throughout this campaign, um, we initially targeted Buffalo um, as that was the main study of this or the main uh, area of this study. Um, we have since Due to some funding uh, errors and issues, we have um, wrapped up the Buffalo component of this study, and we are uh, figuring out ways to expand a lot of these programs to the rest of the county. Um, but we have had a total of 63 uh, Buffalo restaurants and bars respond requesting supplies from our office. 51 Narcan wall units have been deployed, and those are the red wall units that Elizabeth was talking about um, that you can put on the wall, and either persons who work at the, the location can access or um, people who visit that location can access. Reorders are available, and they are actually coming in. So we have uh, several restaurants that have re-requested orders. Um, they are using the bags. They are actually really loving the bags. Apparently, they are some of uh, really good quality bags um, and so they are using them and when we do drop some of these off um, some of our staff have mentioned that they have all the bags lined up um, and so when you walk in it's kind of like a display there's condoms there there's fentanyl test strips um, and some really good conversations have ha have been had in that restaurant um, just from these bags and we have had an increase of requests as well you can go to the next slide, Cheryl. Oh, and I guess I'm done. Yeah. So thank you everyone for your support with this study. If you have any questions, please reach out to Cheryl or myself. And I'll just uh, turn this over to Kelly here. Um, thank you, Taylor, very much. We are so glad that the Healing Communities study was part here. We did learn some stuff. We were able to put some programs in place. And you know, we hope that other folks can learn and from some of our glitches so they don't have to go through them. That's really what this was all about so we could learn as a community. Kelly. Hey, good, good morning, everyone. Okay, so the OMRB has now officially Opiate Fatality Review Board. So going forward, we're going to be calling ourselves Opiate Fatality Review um, starting in January. And that's um, the next slide. So we are in collaboration with a national database, which is why we are now OFR because we will be sending um, national data, which is de-identified to different states. So everybody will be on the same page, but all our information will be de-identified and it's strictly for data. Uh, so we are now op opiate, fatality, opiate fatality review. Our meetings will be resuming in January of 2023. Uh, we are currently recruiting for new members to add to our meetings. We're doing monthly one hour meetings. So please look for an email um, on this, in the second week of December to start this. Currently, I have 15 cases ready to present. And if you can go to the next slide, Cheryl. <clears throat> so um, December 1st is coming up right around the corner. So we are going to be doing our Tree of Hope. Um, if you'd like to add an ornament or a picture, please contact myself or Tamara and we will get that um, going for you. If you would like to um, get a picture instead of not being able to come in, uh, once again, just reach out to one of us. We're here to meet you guys where you're at. We know the holidays are tough and we are gonna be honoring your loved ones. Uh, also, if you are interested in becoming a member of the board, please contact me or Cheryl um, to see if you would be a good fit. We are currently um, going to be soliciting new members and retaining our old membership. And my, last but not least, we're always looking to get Narcan out in the community. Um, so if you're out and about traveling or if you're in an Uber, it's a great conversation starter to see if they would like to carry Narcan. Um, if you're in a position that you think that your job or you know somebody that could um, carry Narcan and get into the community where we can't, please uh, reach out and let us know and we will get that facilitated. Um, this board, uh, 
these slides are short and sweet. I'm going to let you guys go because we've got a lot coming up for January. So stay tuned. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Kelly. And I just want to add what, to what Kelly had said there. Um, we're very lucky to be part of building the national database. That was a grant that Kelly and her team were under for the past four years. So we've been able to work to build this national database, um, which is really going to give us ideas of what's happening all over the country, not just here. We tend to be in our own community and then we'll be in New York State. But we learn so much from each other, what may be happening in California or Idaho when we look at what's affecting people, maybe something that's coming here or it may be here first. So it's really been an opportunity to collaborate nationally and hopefully we can all learn together. This is changing so rapidly, any help we can get greatly appreciated. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and I'm gonna turn this over to Deb. I had the opportunity to pop in, um, they had a family meeting on Thursday and I was really hoping I could stay, but it was like pulled in nine directions. So I went to train the homeless shelter workers instead, and Deb's going to fill you in on everything that's going on. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being part of this task force and for viewing the uh, information that's available. It's easier to disseminate information when we all have it and are able to uh, provide it to members of our community. Mm -hmm. We are the Family and Consumer Advocacy and Support Group. Next slide, please. We hold regular events in the community in order to put a face on the um, on this epidemic. At this point, there's so many families in our immediate community that have lost people to this epidemic that we all, by now, know someone who has buried a loved one. So the health department gets the photographs of um, family members who wish to participate in this event, and they make a display of them around Erie County Hall. This is the display that was put up from August 31st, which is International Overdose Awareness Day. And there were, it was an outdoor event. It was a um, COVID-19 friendly event. And um, so there wasn't any close gathering. There were quite a few people who came to the to the event and who um, who walked through it, who got information, who were uh, present mentally and physically in order to support our, our concerns. Can I have the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. We've had some perspective changes mm -hmm. in our community. The death rate continues to be a concern to the community at all levels. Families are changing their language to reflect the awareness of fentanyl poisoning and domestic terrorism. I think for a long time, families were under the impression that their loved ones died because of a choice. And unfortunately, the choice, the word choice has become a, a trigger for deserves to die or is equal to that, um, to that thought. And that makes it very difficult to get good care. We don't believe that our family's members chose to die. We believe that they were poisoned and they were murdered. We understand that there are people out there who are sick, that addictions develop, and that if they aren't cared for properly, be it medically, mentally, or physically, that the situation can end in a disaster. Well, we are moving away from that word choice to a much more acceptable presentation of what's actually occurring in our communities. Those illegal fentanyl derivatives are evasive, they're everywhere, and people don't know that's what they're getting. Could I have the next slide, please? Education and information on a family level are lacking. For some odd reason, the information that we have here is not filtering into people's homes. And we just have to try to figure out a better way in order to distribute that information and to disseminate it. We family members feel that we carry that. We need to talk to each other. We need to figure out the best way in order to present that information and to work within our own families, communities, state, and respective groups. We do need your help 
and spreading the message to our community that it's here and that measures need to be taken to save lives. Throughout this entire presentation, I've heard that over and over again, and I appreciate that. We all appreciate it. But the messaging is somehow not making it into people's homes. So we need to work just a little harder on that, please. Um, next slide, please. As family members, we need to be included in those collaborative efforts to save lives. Along with the no longer accepting the label of choice, we also are not willing to accept enabler or codependent. Co We're the first line of defense in any disease. We're the main support system, and we are an early intercept point in any type of difficulty that is developing in our community. We would like our voice to be carried throughout um, throughout this process so that we can get have early intervention into people who are struggling. Next slide, please. We are not the victims. In traditional substance use disorder, people affected are confused, they're scared, and they're hurting. Families, people on the outside, friends. People who know you, coworkers, have the ability to identify symptoms in the biological response to medication if they're educated. We need to expand whatever resources we have to include disease management for families so that we can learn this the same way people learn about diabetes, people learn about cancer, they learn about Alzheimer's, any disease. We need to know how to manage it. Next slide, please. Disease management includes empathy. Every interaction, every interaction is an opportunity to say, maybe you could try this, maybe you could try that. In many cases, the person developing the problem doesn't know what's happening to them. Food, shelter, clothing, and medical care are basic human needs. Those need to be available. We need to know where they're available. Next slide, please. We need to change the messages. No one deserves to be poisoned. Fentanyl dealers are predatory. Families are not helpless, and we don't have to wait to develop a plan to save lives. When the message changes, the community response will change. When the stigma is reduced, we'll be able to reach more people, more families, more homes, more loved ones, and work together in order to develop a solid plan that will occur at early intervention points. Next slide, please. Our goals are to develop collaborative efforts to save lives. Change the language, words matter, as Dr. Burstein said at the last meeting, those words are very important. Humane treatment for addiction, mental health, we're all working on that, all of us, because we've all been affected by those at some point. We would like to see consequences for convicted drug dealers because that will send a message that it's not okay to poison our loved ones. We encourage good medicine research standards. Next slide, please. The upcoming event, as uh, Kelly mentioned, was is um, the Tree of Hope. I put up posters and what the ornaments look like and what the tree folk look like for Christmas 2021. And anyone who wishes to add an ornament or um, honor your loved one, honor your grief, we're more than happy to help to facilitate that process. Next slide, please. There are new support groups. One of them is a grief, uh, a grass grief group. It's at 69 Linwood every other Saturday at 1030. And then we've started our new meet and greet, which is family members who are struggling with loved ones who have substance use disorder or who have passed from substance use disorder. It's at 1404 Abbott Road. We'll meet monthly. And the next meeting is December 8th at 6 p.m. Next slide, please. We have a long way to go in this crisis, but I do want to thank everyone for the, the work that we're doing here in this community. We asked for help 
in and you gave it to us. We still need, we still have a long way to go, but we're working together and that's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. We're great. Thank you, Deb. Thank you so much. It's very sobering, you know, when we talk about the families, we tend to forget, you know, and like Deb and I have talked about, we don't want anyone to join our club ever, ever. And we need to keep people healthy out there. So on that note, um, Barbara Burns, are you available? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. So good to be with you virtually. Um, let me start by saying very, very excited um, to share uh, something, uh, the fruits of our labor. Um, we've been telling you over the last couple of meetings how our committee has been working on a PSA. And um, today we are going to preview that for you. Um, let me just start by saying um, huge, huge thanks go out to the Western New York PRC and in collaboration with Hope Chautauqua. Um, who came to us um, about a year ago and said, you know, we would love to, to help fund um, something in the, you know, messaging category. So um, from just kind of like an idea um, to the finished product. Um, and we're really excited because um, the funding went towards um, the filming and the editing and everything else was done on just good old fashioned hard work by the members of our committee and everybody worked really, really hard on this. And um, I think you're gonna see a couple people in the PSA that you recognize um, and we're so grateful to them. And you might uh, recognize the background voice um, of Joe Chili, a longtime um, radio guy in Buffalo. He, he offered up his services um, pro bono to us, um, just a really good community minded guy. So um, let me, Right. Right, let me stop sharing my screen so you can share. Okay. So everybody cross your fingers. All right. So let me hold on here. I'm working on it. Give me a okay. second. Here. <laughs> All right. I think you are. I think you got it. I right. think you got now, my IT guy set me all up just a little while ago. So I'm hitting the share button, hitting the share audio button. I'll pop that up. All right. So can y'all see it? I can see a video. Okay, so I'm going to start it now. <laughs> Hope you can hear it. Here we go. Prior to being prescribed opiates, I really had no idea of the true danger of addiction. And that's definitely something I wish I would have known about before taking that first pill. Hi, my name is Alex. I was prescribed opiates after a football injury. I have been sober for six years. Even though I am sober, it is still a day by day battle. Alex is not alone. Anyone can become dependent, even when a medication is prescribed by a doctor. To prevent substance misuse, know the facts, do your research, and ask questions. Before you are prescribed a medication, talk to your doctor. Be sure to ask, what are the risks with this medication? What are potential side effects? How do I know if I'm at risk for developing a problem with this pain medication? And what are signs that I should look for that I am developing? a problem I should come see you sooner now that I know I want you to know that there's help out there and it works please remember safe use safe storage safe disposal yay it played thank you thank you um, very nice Barb thank you so there you have it folks we we started with the whole idea that um you know some people still you know it it, it begins with you know the the pain medication and so we thought we would do you know a message to the entire community about having you know thoughtful conversations with your doctor um and the, the two folks that you'll recognize are alex newts um former ub football player um who was injured and and was given pain medication Alex, I mean, from the minute go when we thought, you know, he would be good um, to be a participant in this. He was, you know, just sign me up, whatever you need. Um, just such a wonderful young man who is just so willing to share his story and his struggles and just just so inspired by him um, and his story. And then Dr. 
Adele Syed, Dr. Sarah, forgive me if you're on the call. She was absolutely wonderful. And I have to give a shout out to Dr. Tilda because she's actually the one who um, suggested Dr. Sarah. Um, so we're so grateful um, for her, her input. Um, so we, like I said, we just this ragtag team of our, you know, our members of our committee and we're, we're just so thrilled um, at the way it, it turned out. Um, so where we are right now is we are in the final stages of doing a media launch for our PSA. Um, so hopefully you're going to start seeing that kind of out there um, in the community. We will also be um, sharing it with you. We're trying to figure out the best way technology wise to get it all to you so that you all can hopefully maybe share it on your websites and your social media sites for us. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do, if there's any doctors who are out there watching, we're trying to find um, a good way to maybe get into some of those television screens, those internal monitors that some um, medical practices have in their um, in their offices and in their buildings. So if anybody um, has any um, you know information on the best, you know, we've we've done a little reach out to different um, organizations on, you know, trying to figure that out. But if anybody has an avenue that might be able to, um, you know, reach out to us, please, please let me know. Um, or, you know, not even just a doctor's office. Um, sometimes you walk into businesses and, you know, they have waiting rooms and they have televisions up to, you know, to keep people busy or, you know, keep people distracted while they're waiting for an appointment or something. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. So we're really looking, um, we've got a good kind of outline to get some widespread distribution on this. Mm -hmm. um, we think it's it's what's called an evergreen PSA, which means it never outdates. Um, it's not like a time thing that's gonna end af you know, after a month or so. Or, um, so we're just really excited um, to kind of um, put the period on this. Um, so yeah, so that's where we're at with that. And I just wanted to make a comment um, uh, to to continue on something Deb said in her presentation um, about the language. Language is so very important, and that is something that our committee focused on um, over the last couple of years. And right before COVID hit, we had gone around and done meetings at the local. Uh, TV stations, radio stations, um, to, and one of the things that we touched, it was basically just to say, hey, you know, we're the education and awareness committee um, of the task force. Here's what we do. Here's how we can help you, um, you know, and one of the things that we touched on was language and it really did those visits made a difference. So back on overdose awareness day on August 31st, one of the local stations, um, I won't call them out by name because they were so gracious. Um, they used um, they used an old photo of like a triggering photo, and I was watching the story and right away it caught my attention. Um, so the next day I reached out to the news director and I said, "Hey," and he said, "I saw it. It. I talked to the editor about it. It won't happen again." So. Good. Getting that out there is making a difference. It was just a, a newer kind of younger person who wasn't aware of, um, you know, that this is that this is, you know, an issue. Um, so they were so gracious and kind about it. And so, again, like I, Deb, I hear you, we hear you. And, you know, if we all just continue to have that that conversation, um, we are making definitely making a difference. So I just wanted to share that little uh, that little piece of news. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Barb. That's amazing. Um, if you can get that link out, I'll send it out to the task force if we can figure out somewhere to house it. Um, mm -hmm. However, that may work out. I know Kara might be on here, maybe utilizing a YouTube channel to pl plunk it up there. I'm not sure whatever you think would work best. Sure. OK, yeah, that's uh, yeah. we're going to be addressing that in the next couple of days. So that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. All right. Let me get my PowerPoint back up here a minute and give me one second. And we will continue. All righty here. So on that note, got through bar and I'm going to turn this over to probation to Anita Robillard. Um, they've just completed a 4 year program, which was just about 5 years. Some amazing outputs, I'm thinking, 
it's interesting, you know, because we are all talking about stigma and how we treat people. And department by department, we're really working on changing the culture within our departments. Is everything perfect? Absolutely not. But we go back, we re-educate, and nobody's given up. So, Anita. Hello, everyone. So, I wanted to give you an update on what we're doing here in the probation department. And I typically start out kind of with a general what's going on specifically with our opioid unit. So, Cheryl, if you'll go forward. So right now we have our one opioid unit and we have uh, currently 25 probationers on that unit at the moment. Our peer navigators though, uh, we are two of them, are providing extra support for a total between the two of them, 65 probationers. So wow. everybody on our unit and then additional people that are on uh, caseloads with other officers. And these people um, from the other caseloads are identified. Often we find out that they've had an overdose or during a conversation with their probation officer, uh, they've identified some struggles. So uh, we offer a linkage to a peer navigator. Um, unfortunately, we've had two probationers uh, rearrested uh, in the last couple. Of, we kind of did this data in the last three months since this. Um, Task force have been um, done. We have nine active violations of probation, which is fairly high for our unit. Although at least three of those um, are people, we have had people that absconded from our unit from probation um, that were picked up. So though that is part of the active violations of probation. We have five probationers currently um, at inpatient facilities working on getting their recovery on track. Uh, three probationers in jail, which I believe almost all of them are because they absconded from probation and are active in violation status. Uh, thankfully, uh, we have not had any uh, fatal overdoses and we had one uh, probationer on the unit that had a non-fatal um, overdose uh, in the last three months. So that is the current status. Um, we have been working since 2019, um, gathering information. And so I wanna share with everyone that our department so far this year um, has distributed 71 Narcan kits. And uh, over the course uh, of the grant, we have um, distributed 209. And actually that's just the ones that we know of. In all of our waiting rooms, we have our, the Narcan boxes. So uh, people, I have to regularly go walk through. Um, officers know that uh, they can tell their people to feel free to take them. Uh, and we also, in our victim impact panels, we try to also offer Narcan during those since uh, people who um, may have been uh, arrested for a alcohol related or a drunk or a um, impaired by drugs related um, event, mm -hmm. they uh, may need to be aware of uh, the availability of Narcan. Um, we also provide information on the never use alone. And um, if possible, I also bring some Narcan strips, not Narcan strips, I'm sorry, fentanyl strips um, and explain that to people. Um, it's been well received by both the pe by people that are there and the guests that they bring um, to the victim impact panel. So that's really great and a positive. I'm trying very hard on my end to, again, reduce that stigma. We liken it to the first aid, so it's the same messaging going out across all of the, the different venues that we have here that are working on the opioid um, epidemic. So over the course of this grant, we have also um, done 4,309 drug screenings. Essentially, that is the way that we had identified initially to get people kind of sorted to see who had the most severe problem. Um, it screens for everything. Um, we particularly use it to look at our opioid population and who has uh, severe issues, self-identified nonetheless, um, with those drug screens. Uh, we've had 72 probationers 
uh, during the course of the grant that have been linked with our opioid unit. And we've had 150 probationers in total that were linked with uh, peer navigation services. Uh, so I think that that has um, made some significant differences, um, or at least within our department. We have a lot of officers that utilize those peer navigation services, not only for their probationers, but I find that many officers go um, to the peer navigators for information or assistance in how to dialogue or just kind of get on the same page um, in response to whoever it is that they're working with. Next slide, please. So we, uh, our grant officially ended on September 30th. So we have done some transition work um, so there's some stuff that was grant related that we don't have to do anymore. And there's a lot of stuff though that we decided we are gonna continue to do. So our department is gonna continue to collect our overdose data for the department. We're continuing to um, log and uh, keep track of our Narcan distribution. And our TCU, uh, our drug screens, uh, we're gonna continue that, especially since that's one of the ways that we will be um, identifying who will come into our unit. Um, we will be hiring two additional peer navigators. And I just kind of put some of those other practices. Uh, those, when somebody does a drug screen, a TCU drug screen, and they've identified as being a, the score is, um, it's a one or a zero through 11. It's a six and above, it's, a, it's considered severe. And if they've identified any type of opioid as problematic, they are referred to our unit. Our caseload size actually um, had been capped at 30 during our grant, and we're going down to 25 because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of dialogue between a lot of different people, and it can get uh, a little overwhelming sometimes. Um, and then any additional ones can be on a case by case basis. Uh, we still will offer Narcan. We still have our wall um, boxes and we will be offering Narcan within the unit at home calls. Um, if they have a non-fatal overdose, uh, an officer will be following up within 24 to 48 hours just to kind of make sure, do they, do they need Narcan? Is there anything they need to be linked to? Um, and our unit is also continuing to encourage interactive journaling which is a cognitive behavioral intervention, which pairs well with, kind of, with recovery in, and working on the issues so that um, hopefully the recovery period will be longer uh, for our people. All right, next. Oh, see, short and sweet. Um, and our, so far these are, all of our people remain in our opioid test, our opioid unit. We have our supervisor, our officer, and our two peer navigators. And then we will be interviewing for our two new peer navigators and working on what roles and responsibilities they will have also. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to contact me and I will forward any information to the appropriate person. We're always looking for input. So if uh, anybody has any suggestions, um, also, feel free to contact me. So, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much. And on that, I'm going to stop sharing and take a look at the questions in the chat, and we will go through them. How does that sound? So, thank you, everyone. You're doing amazing work out there, incredible amounts of work out there. This meeting each quarter it just kind of blows me away, and I'm at the forefront of this. Um, so, thank you. I can't thank you enough. I do want to put out there my reminder here. Um, everyone, please be careful. Test strips are available. Narcan is available. Use one at a time. We're looking at a different person. The holidays are coming up. We're talking about stimulants. We're talking about social party drugs. People, please, please be careful. We will give you all the Narcan you need. We'll give you all the test strips you need. Share this message in your families, your friends, your visitors. So on that, I'm going to jump on to here. Um, Dr. Nielsen, how are you? Can you expound more on cannabis-related fentanyl? We've heard a lot about cocaine and fentanyl, but street cannabis now also being found to have fentanyl contamination. 
I have actually reached out to the DEA about that. We met with them. At that time, they were not, they did not have any contaminated cannabis at that point. Uh, I see Dr. Burstein is going to reach out to our local lab and see what's there, but I am not aware of any locally. I do check with them regularly. I'll be honest with you, I'll be out there ringing a bell so loud, everyone will hear that. So be aware of that one. Um, Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, definitely. I'll be ringing that bell, let me tell you. Uh, let's see. Testing substances for fentanyl. Yes, Tilda, thank you for bringing that up. And we are aware of that people are buying fentanyl. Traditional opioid users want fentanyl. What we're talking about are people who are not anticipating it. People that are in the clubs that are buying party drugs, um, stimulants in that category. That's, these are the folks that are kind of blindsided. So I think we have two categories here. So if we can continue to encourage people, you know, that know that they're purchasing fentanyl, be careful. Take small amounts. We understand you don't feel good. People that have no idea, test your product. We really need to do this. Um, it's a different world and it's it's really scary. It is scary out there. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Sublocade and those incarcerated individuals. I do believe that they have two people on sublocade so far, they said, Dr. Dosher, but I'm not sure what the choice is. Um, Tom, are you still on? How do people... He had, to, he had to leave, I think, but it'd um, okay. be great if we could get some input from him on this. Um, I mean, is it a patient choice? This is my question. Yeah, it'd be it would just be great to be sure that people are being educated and that it's offered. Um, because I know when we first talked about it years ago, you know, there's a worry about diversion. Sublocade wasn't available then, but that would put a lot to rest, including the safety because I know some of the people were have been discharged and were sent over to Matt Padoa because something happened with the prescription when they left their incarcerated setting. So um it would just give a level of safety that I think would be fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um yeah that would be it would give them that bridge to get to that treatment provider. I agree with you totally. We've been seeing people on the street here, and I will agree with you. And generally, what we do is we link them right with matters, we, who the folks are. Um, but it would be better if they came out on something. You're correct. Uh, prevention be included in the athletic grant. What athletic grant? I missed that. That was the one that Jennifer... Um... Jennifer Seib was talking about when she was going through grants that they were working on. I'm sorry. Is that the one that Juliana was speaking to? Might have been. I think so. Yeah. We're talking I think about there was the talk about treatment and um, other things, but I didn't hear anything mentioned about prevention being part of that, you know, talking to the athletic directors and stuff. Um, the adult drug court one that I was talking about doesn't have anything to do with athletic directors. Yeah. So I'm not, I don't know if that's what I was talking about. I'm not sure either. I, I thought, Jennifer, didn't you mention something about the, the grant that was, you were working with athletic? I'm not, are you trying to go pull my slides back up just to see, like, is there something in there? But I, no. I don't recall that either. No, I don't recall that either. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh, central police, Gail, you're going to check um, family button on the app for matters. Is there a button? Kaylee, you still on? Kaylee and I are both still here. I answered okay. it further down. There's a button that says I need help. That's for patients and family members. Okay, so there's not something marked family. It's I need help. Okay. Correct. Wall units, absolutely. Um, anyone that needs them, please reach out to any of us here on our team. You can call our main number at 858-7695. Um, it will get to the right person. You can go on the website. They are out there as Elizabeth shared and we have more to get out there. Um, PSA, as soon as we can 
Yeah, I was looking at that. At PSA, if uh, as soon as we can figure out a way to get that link to you, get it housed somewhere, and I know Barb's working on that, we'll get that out to you ASAP, because I think that can be shared in huge places. I'm thinking we have a unit down here, and think about your own organizations. There's a large screen down in the lobby here. There's DMV screens. There's clinic screens. I like the idea of the clinic sites also, but realize those are companies, so you might have to get them in through the company, like in those clinics, like they buy this it's a whole issue there. Um, let's see what else we got here. Yes, probation is doing amazing things. Uh, my question, do we have any info on possibly having supervised consumption sites in Erie County? No, we do not. Um, there is a good piece on the overdose site, the state site, one of the sites, um, one point in New York City, they did an interview there. But you can also talk to Joyce Rivera. She's been running one in Queens for quite a while. And they might give you some information. I do know the state is looking at it. And something I didn't even address, address the state board. I sit on the state settlement board also. It is something that is being discussed there also, folks. But as far as it, it is still illegal in New York State, and they're going to have to lift that up. They are having great outcomes in New York City. I'm putting it right there. And I'm hoping that that data really pushes people to do this, to be perfectly honest with you. The report was put out by the State Settlement Board. It is available on the state site. I'll send the link out to everybody that was put out by the Settlement Board. We're waiting for feedback from the legislature right now. We have a meeting scheduled on, oh gosh, what is it, December 9th to address whatever feedback the legislature has. And then we'll put it back and it is recommendations on how New York State should release funding. The settlement board is an advisory board at the state level. I just want to put it out there for folks. People are like, when's the money coming? When the, when the state releases the RFAs, I'm going to put, that's how it's going to work. So really the advisory board is an advisory board. We determined on what categories the dollars should be spent in. The biggest amount is recommended to be spent in harm reduction. So everyone is aware. I think people have come on board and understand that. So exciting. Um, not quick enough for some of us, but we're not giving up. We're never going to give up. Ever, ever, ever going to give up. Amazing work going on in this community. Um, people, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, Mary Jo Alessio, yes, we are working with the community very closely. Um, we actually have the Friendsgiving dinner coming up next week. I've been out in all the bars up on, <laughs> on Chippewa, hanging out with my friends again. They all have wall units, they have test strips. I've been at Q, I've been at Frizzies. Um, you know, we're really getting the word out there. Um, I'll be at, interestingly, Town Ballroom at an EDM concert this Saturday, training people on Narcan before the show and at intermission. Um, we're trying anything to get this message out to people, willing to go anywhere. So. Fingers are crossed here. Any ideas people have, connections that you have, please let us know. We will be there. It's too important to get this message out there. Wow, I'm going to give you all back 15 minutes of your life here. This is amazing. We never end early. This is to make up for the last meeting when we were 15 minutes late. So thank you all so very much. Holidays are coming. Everybody be very, very safe. Text us for Narcan, text us for test strips. Make sure you have them in your home. You have visitors coming in town. Be honest and open. Everybody be safe. I hope to see everybody after the holidays. Take care. Thanks, Cheryl. Take care, everyone.